Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is part three for the Wellbeing um, Series for Planetary Health. My name is Molly Bust, and I'm the Community Relations Manager at the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. And my role for the webinar is to moderate the chat. Um, so as we get started, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, perhaps sharing where you're joining us from or what you're excited to learn about this afternoon or a word or a phrase maybe about how you're feeling today. Um, before I turn things over to Bakken Center Director, Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, just a few logistical items I wanted to cover to help you navigate the webinar functions. Um, you're welcome to share your thoughts and comments in the chat box. And if you're comfortable and do want to share your responses with all participants, just make sure you update the two field in the chat box to all panelists and attendees. And then just note, you have the opportunity to minimize the chat box during um, the presentation. And we invite for you to do that during the components that aren't interactive to help uh, you remain present. There's also a Q&A icon where you can submit your questions and our director, Mary Jill, will pose as many questions as we have time for after uh, the presentation. If you aren't able to find those icons, hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen and they should appear for you. Uh, we will send an email with a recording of today's webinar and other resources on planetary health afterwards. So please watch for that. I'll now turn things over to Mary Jo. Well, thank you very much, Molly. And thank you all for joining us for part three of the Wellbeing Series for Planetary Health. If you missed part one, which featured talks from Dr. Katherine Wilkinson and Craig Minowa, or part two, which featured Minnesota health experts who discussed planetary health, you may view a video of this event on our website, and Molly will put that in the chat. It's z.umn.edu slash wellbeing series. Thank you to Medtronic, our lead sponsor, and our 25th anniversary champions, the Kalmanson Foundation, the Smaby Family Foundation, and Dorothy and Mike Perry. I'd also like to thank our community and university partners, plus the many great friends who have helped make this series successful. You can find a full list of all of our supporters on the center's website. Since 2012, the center has hosted well-being thought leaders to inspire and educate the community, organizations, and lifelong learners through our well-being series. Today's presentation will feature inspiring local nonprofit leaders who will share about the work being done toward planetary health here in Minnesota and how you can get involved. Following their presentations, They'll participate in a lively panel discussion and there'll be opportunity to answer your questions. So as Molly said, um, feel free to enter your questions um, into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. It's really helpful if you put them there instead of the chat. If you put them in the chat, they sometimes get lost. So I'd like to next introduce our first um, two speakers, Julia Frost Nurban and Catherine Jordan. Julia is executive director for the Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, where Catherine Jordan also volunteers. Interfaith Power and Light is an interfaith community co-creating a just and sustainable world. It works to build the interfaith climate movement in Minnesota by empowering faith communities across the state to take action that is authentic, effective, and energizing through leadership development programs, and action opportunities. I'll turn it over now to Julia and Catherine. All right, I am unmuted. Thank you. Um, Molly, are you going to put the slides up or should I do that? Great, thanks. Okay, so thank you so much for this beautiful event. Um, as you heard, I'm the executive director of Interfaith Power and Light in Minnesota, and I'm also a professor at the University of, of Minnesota in Sustainability Studies, where I do my best to empower my students to use their education and their voice to take action. So I'll start by saying that we've got a real problem here. Um, as Ed Maybach at George Mason says, climate change is real. We see it here in Minnesota and across the world. 
fires, floods, displacement, war, it's really serious. The experts agree, and there might even be something that we can do about it. So you'll remember um, way back in 2009, um, there was a conference of the peoples in Copenhagen. And as a conservation biologist who understood the dire nature of cl the climate trajectory, even back then I was very obsessed with the promise of this international climate agreement. Big problems demanded big solutions, I thought. And so my students did, did presentations on Copenhagen. We planned watch parties. We hosted our first 350.org rally at the state capitol to draw attention to the urgency. Here was our chance to solve the climate crisis once and for all. And of course, you know how that story ended. World leaders left Copenhagen without any meaningful progress. And the time came and went, there was no change. I was perhaps sort of unreasonably devastated at that time. Even my academic colleagues seemed to go on with their business as usual. And at that time, I was the mother of a six-year-old and a two-year-old. So my days were filled day to night. And yet when I entered the winter, I found myself in a profound depression. What would I be leaving to my children? What lies had I told to my students? What could be next? I didn't even have the energy to get up in the morning, let alone offer any meaningful solutions. So months came and went and I trudged on until one day in early summer, I took myself for a run. And uh, thank goodness for endorphins. I was finally cruising along, feeling pretty good for the first time in a long while. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. If we were gonna make it through this century and thrive, it was gonna be up to all of us on the ground. Uh, we had to create a bottom-up uh, movement that would transform the system. Um, I didn't really know what that looked like. Um, I couldn't yet imagine the specifics, but at least I had my pilot light, light lit and I got home from that run and I called some friends and we gathered on my front porch to get busy planning what was then called the global work day. Um, we were highlighting the bottom up solutions that were already bubbling up in our communities. That was the first meeting of what would eventually become Minnesota 350. And I would then go on to become the executive director of MNIPL. Um, can you switch the slide, Molly? Uh, where we work in faith communities to bring the lights of tens of thousands of faith actors into the climate movement. What I learned coming out of that depression has framed my work till this day. Rather than single solutions made by people in power, the movement calls for passionate, powerful people operating in community engaged um, movements on the ground. I needed a different recipe and a different scale from Copenhagen. So I dove down into the work of my colleagues at the American Psychological Association. Next slide. What were the barriers to people taking action on climate change? When people feel powerless, uncertain, when they feel disconnected and alone, they tend to turn away. They focus on other things. What could we do in our organizations that would turn this around? I've learned a lot about movements since that time. And I'm gonna just share a few highlights before I hand my mic over to my colleague, Catherine Jordan, to talk about one program that we're really excited about. Um, the first, next slide. Um, the first recipe I offer, um, is one about strategy, narrative, and action. I remember seven or eight years ago diving into this with my good friend, Sam Grant, and you'll hear from him in a few minutes. Um, in order to build a movement powerful enough to people, turn on people's imagination and their courage, we need um, not only the strategies in their head, but we need their stories, and together that will give them the power to take collective action. Strategy, narrative, and then action. Without engaging people in people's personal stories, we won't have the power needed to fuel collective action. Um, I just wanna make a footnote on this and say that right now, what people are talking about is not uh, small climate solutions. People are talking about loss. They're talking about family. They're talking about grieving um, their community. They're talking about racial justice. So you know, be careful as we think about what to talk about. We have to be listening. Um, next slide. The next part of this recipe um, is, um, is to scale up from motivated, heart-inspired individuals to build networks. Next slide. Um, this is called, oops, that's too far, but that's okay. Actually, go back one. Um, this is called the snowflake model. The MNIPL 
know we do this by supporting a statewide multi-faith leadership team to go forth and empower others. Each of these actors creates their own team made up of community connectors within individual faith communities. And as Marshall Gans has so aptly said, leadership is accepting the responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Um, next slide. You can see here that if we have one big statewide goal like stopping line three, we need not only many organizations, but we um, need to um, have networked individuals growing movements across the state. Next slide. At MNIPL, we have a number of on-ramps for action that folks um, take leadership around, um, but I'm gonna hand it to Catherine, who's just gonna talk about that last one, our household climate justice program. Next slide. Thanks, Julia. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm a volunteer with MNIPL, and I'm also the chair of the University of Minnesota's Friends of the Libraries. Did you know that each of us Americans on average spends 16 tons of greenhouse gases every year, more than twice the global average? If climate, ju if climate justice household program can help each of us reduce our carbon footprint and increase our advocacy impact, we will be successful. Next slide. A number of us wanted answers beyond changing light bulbs for what we could do to make real climate change. We wanted to know what actions would have the greatest impact. MNIPL was already organizing congregations to take actions, so it was a natural step to start organizing households to support change at the most basic level of personal behavior. A small group of us volunteers designed the Climate Justice Household Program to pro provide you with tools, skills, and support to make a plan and follow it. Next slide. Earlier, Julia talked about how to unite the head, the heart, and the hands to create positive action. The Climate Justice Household Program uses a similar three-legged stool model to address important aspects of the crisis, the practical, the systemic, and the relational or spiritual level. Just like a stool is out of balance if one or two of the legs are missing, we are out of balance if we focus on only one aspect of the work. If we only work on reducing our our utility bills, but neglect sharing our concerns with elected officials or caring, our emotion, or caring for our emotional health, we will be less effective and run the chance of burning out. We must manage our personal carbon footprint, engage in climate justice action, and care for ourselves and each other to sustain the effort over the coming decades. It's much like a, a spiritual practice. Next slide. First, the practical leg focuses on what we can do in our lives, at home, at work, and at play. Planning tools will introduce you to strategies developed for Minnesota communities that will help you save money and reduce your carbon footprint related to utilities, diet, your transportation, personal consumption, and home improvements. Next slide. The second leg of the stool is the systemic. The household planner will help you organize your advocacy and political activities. You can join organizations like the Global Climate Strike or Stop Line 3 Movement. Organize activities in school or in your faith community. You can write to your elected officials and the media to advocate for your point of view. There's a three and a half percent theory of change I wanna share with you. History shows that social movements with three and a half percent of the population taking action are successful. And that's what we're up to. Next, next slide, please. The third leg is spiritual or relational. This crisis that we're facing is a relay race. It's not a sprint or even a marathon. We must learn how to balance our health and well being with the tasks at hand. We can call upon our faith traditions and wisdom, spend time in nature, learn stress reduction and mindfulness techniques, bring discussion of climate justice into various communities so that we are not alone. Building a culture of caring for the humans, animals, plants, ecosystems, and the environment itself is an essential part of the work. Maintaining a focus on healthy relationships within the community itself is vital. Next slide. The Climate Justice Household Program relies on SMART goals to achieve our outcomes. It will help you to write goals that are clearly defined, they're measurable, worth doing, 
They use the resources at hand and they're time bound. Part of the problem with plans and even the best plan in the world is if they're too vague, they're not achievable. We support SMART goals so there's a chance these plans can work. Next slide. I live with my husband, Steve, who is not a planner. <laughs> and he shares my deep concern about the need for all of us to address the climate crisis. Food production and eliminating food waste was a top priority for us this year. Steve built two raised beds on our front lawn so that we can grow our own tomatoes, kale, Swiss chard, and herbs, and eat a more plant-based diet. I reorganized our refrigerator to minimize spoilage. I helped, with, I helped form a climate justice team at my congregation where we hosted a two-hour webinar called Turn Down the Heat to share practical ideas with the congregation. And I participated in climate strike marches. We also own land in Northern Minnesota that we have put into a 50 year covenant to protect from development. And we hired a forester to prepare a woodland stewardship plan. Steve has become an honorary beaver and he works with the beavers to manage the water flow in our pond. We both feel restored walking in nature and sharing its beauty with younger generations. Next slide. So there are many ways to follow the three-legged stool model. If you're a planner like me, uh, you can use the tools that we've developed for you. If you're a non-planner like Steve, the tool is a way to reflect on what you've already accomplished to address the many aspects of our consumption. Here are the six steps to consider when designing your plan. Next slide. The plan is free. You can start in by logging into mnipl.org slash household and sign up for your, sign your household or group of friends or neighbors up for the planning process. Next slide. Then gather your household or group for an in-person or a virtual meeting to discuss your goals and commitments for the year. It's great if you can come up with a vision. What, what do you plan to accomplish by the end of the year? For us, it was about reducing food waste and eating more plant-based a plant-based diet. Now, next slide, please. You can also measure your current carbon profile and determine possible actions to take by visiting a carbon tracker. We are using one called coolcongregations.org, uh, but there are many on the, out on the web. Next slide. Then develop your SMART goals for each aspect of the plan. Come up with some practical ideas, some systemic actions, and then the spiritual and relational. How do you build community so that you are not alone? Next slide. Then fill out the household climate justice plan form so that we can continue to send you resources and help you track your process. Next slide. So remember, you are not alone. Uh, MNIPL staff are standing by to assist you with ideas, suggestions, troubleshooting, and additional resources. They can set up webinars for your group to walk through the Climate Justice Household Planner Program and the Carbon Tracker. They're available for one-on-one -on -one calls or Zoom sessions. They'll share resources and stories of how others are utilizing the program, and they'll collect your feedback so that we can improve the tools. Next slide. Remember all of our personal actions support our political action. Remember that we are stronger when we work together. Remember caring for ourselves, our family, our neighbor and our community will keep us whole and resilient for the long haul. When we scale up our personal action, we build the movement for change. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Julia and Catherine. So I love the focus on head, heart, hands, strategy, narrative and action, and really appreciate your focus on such practical and concrete um, solutions. So I'm next going to introduce um, Kira Liu. And Kira is a um, community engagement coordinator at the Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy. Climate Generation empowers individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change with the goal of building a more equitable and resilient future for all. Climate Generation is dedicated to climate change education, youth leadership, 
and community engagement for innovative climate change solutions. So welcome, Kira. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna get my slides up here. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Kira. I use she, her pronouns and um, I'm joining from Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy. Um, I'm excited to join this awesome panel um, and uh, joining from remotely from my home in Minnesota on the traditional ancestral and contemporary occupied lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. So today I am excited to share a little bit about climate generation and the importance of talking about climate change through storytelling. But to talk about climate change today, we also need to acknowledge the many overlapping crises in our world. Um, climate change, racial injustice, and the COVID-19 pandemic have all exposed injustices in our systems and the interconnected relationships between them. Climate change and racial justice in particular are deeply interconnected. They were built and are being perpetuated by the same economic and political structures, systems, and policies, and we cannot effectively address one without addressing the other. In a recent Harvard study, areas, of, uh, areas with communities of color are more likely to experience high levels of air pollution than white communities, contributing to a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in Black and Latino communities. Yet, according to opinion polling conducted by Yale's program on climate change communication, Black and Latino voters are also among the most concerned about the climate crisis and also among the most willing to take action. So I'm encouraged to see the power of our voices coming together to demand justice. And we've seen that we can scale from individual to collective action in ways that can result in significant impact. Um, and as an organization, Climate Generation is committed to deepening our own efforts to work in coalition with others doing this critical work. Um, and by elevating the voices and stories and leadership of those who have often been left out of mainstream conversations on climate change. So our organization's mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. And we do this um, by engaging in education and empowerment across sectors. So working with educators and youth, communities and influential leaders in uh, business, policy and music and the arts. We work with educators to support climate change education across all subjects, whether that's in, in person or in the virtual classroom. We work to elevate the moral imperative and push for a future built on innovation through supporting youth voices. And in our community engagement program, we work to normalize conversations about climate change impacts and solutions and really embolden leadership of influentials to act on climate change. And at Climate Generation, we found that stories are a really effective way for us to talk about climate change. At the core of our work at Climate Generation is the power of personal narrative. Our organization was literally built on the power of a climate story. We were founded by Will Steger, who is a polar explorer, a former classroom educator, and a climate change advocate. And for over 50 years, Will has inspired people through his accounts of climate change in the polar regions, witnessing the disintegration of some of the world's major ice shelves in Antarctica and Greenland, all occurring more rapidly than scientific models had projected and something Will, that never, Will imagined would never happen in his lifetime. But of course we know that the story of our melting polar ice caps is not a standalone, but rather an indicator of rapidly changing climate that we are all facing. Um, and we've seen recent fires in the West and hurricanes in the South just in this year, along with many other repercussions of climate change. And Will shared his story as a vehicle, not only to engage people through his Arctic adventures, but to really educate people about climate change and that inspire them to take action themselves. And many people used to think that we only had a few accounts like Will to paint the picture of climate change for us. But now it has become increasingly clear that given the imprint of climate change all around us, we are all eyewitnesses and we all have important stories to tell. 
Um, so I'd love to just take a moment and, and turn it over to the audience to pose a question of what motivates you to care about climate change? Um, so you can take a moment, maybe post it in the chat and share with others um, and keep this motivation in mind as we talk about uh, personal stories. So we know that one of the most important things is to talk about climate change. And in many places, talking about climate change is still not normal. According to the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, opinion polls show that 70% of Americans understand that climate change is happening and that it'll cause harm to future generations. Yet two thirds of Americans say they never talk about it. So we know that there is a disconnect between people feeling concerned but lacking the confidence. Um, so one of the most important things that we can do to address climate change is to talk about it. After all, we know that talking about it drives uh, public opinion and public opinion influences decision-making. But for a long time, the way that we have talked about climate change has mostly been from a scientific perspective. And while the science is essential, it's actually when we balance our stories with the science that we can place our facts and figures into context. Um, and for thousands of years, indigenous cultures around the world have also been making these observations and connections. So it's important to note that science itself is a Western idea. Stories, on the other hand, have played a critical role in forming cultural identity, language, spirituality, and understanding relationships both with one another and with the natural world. And when we invite other ways of knowing, the result is that we really get a fuller and a richer understanding of this issue. And research tells us that information alone is not enough to move people to change behavior. Um, and stories really help us move out of our heads and into our hearts, connecting climate change with what we care about and can really serve as a powerful tool for advocating for collective solutions. And when told from a personal perspective, they also have the ability to draw out an emotional connection, which is incredibly important for a complicated issue like climate change. Um, we know, because we know that climate change is emotional, there is a whole spectrum of emotions when learning about and dealing with climate change, from loss and despair to hope and resolve, and that is because we as humans are at the very center of it. We ourselves are the culprits, the victims, and we hold each other, we, we each hold the power to influence solutions. And I think when we fundamentally understand that this is a people issue, not only a violence against the planet, um, is when we can truly get to the heart of why climate change is something to be felt in our bones. And if we're being honest, I think that, I would imagine that many of us here today have felt some level of grief about climate change. Um, I know that I have. And according to the American Psychological Association, the traumas that are associated with climate change impacts can have an enormous effect on our mental, social, and spiritual well being, um, and sometimes even at a greater intensity than physical impacts. Yet, I think it's possible that the grief that we feel can also serve as a transformational catalyst that can galvanize us. As you look at all of us here who are on this webinar today, I think we can be encouraged that we are not alone and that there are people here that we can reach out to for support and to invite us in to join in taking action. Um, and I think even the process of finding your own climate story can be therapeutic. Um, so through reflection and writing can really prompt a path for healing. Um, so sometimes just acknowledging the emotions we feel and naming them can be really helpful. And when we then share our stories with others, it can be a really validating and empowering experience. So I'd love to hear from everyone again. It's wonderful to see the chat populating. So if you could post in the chat and say um, how you have been feeling about climate change lately. We know that there is this spectrum of emotions and we um, should lean into how people are feeling and, and the, the tone of the community. 
Um, and by sharing our stories and our feelings, we can build connections with one another in a really authentic way, um, both to gain confidence talking about climate change and to advocate for solutions. Um, so Climate Generation recently published a book called Eyewitness, Minnesota Voices on Climate Change, which is a collection of stories, poetry, and artwork created by people across the state on their own experiences of climate change. And although the stories in this book are from Minnesota alone, the themes themselves are universal of gratitude, loss, responsibility, resilience, and hope. Um, and through sharing stories, we hope to elevate the voices of individuals and communities who are often not included in mainstream conversations about climate change, people of color, low income communities, people with disabilities, youth, and others who are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, and in the same way that storytelling can connect to the emotional side of the issue, artistic forms of expression like art and poetry um, engage our being in a really creative and innovative way um, and help us process what climate change means for us. And uh, Eyewitness is really a demonstration of literary activism to galvanize people to find their own climate story. Um, and we hope that this book can serve as a tool for people to facilitate conversations within their communities and with policymakers to advocate for climate solutions. So we are excited to share that Climate Generation will be delivering a copy of the Eyewitness book to every Minnesota policymaker in 2021 at the beginning of the new legislative session, paired with letters written by all of you. So we know that there has uh, never been a more important time for us to demand bold action on climate change from our policymakers and really make it clear that climate justice needs to be a priority. And we know that one of the most important things that we can all do right now is vote. So if you are eligible, make sure you are registered and have requested your mail-in ballot or have made a plan to vote in person because this is really a priority. But if you have done that and you are ready for the next step, we have created a fill in the blank style template to write a letter to your legislator that you can personalize with your own climate story. So you can follow the link um, I have on the slide here, and I'll also post it in the chat, climateeyewitness.org slash letter. Um, and, or if you prefer to write your own letter, you can um, do that as well in the link provided. Um, because we know that no matter what happens in the next election, that we have a lot of work to do um, and a lot of work cut out for us. Um, so we hope to get a letter from every legislative district in the state of Minnesota. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone who's on this webinar today can join me in submitting a letter and also sharing this opportunity with your family and friends and community around the state um, to make sure that we your letter, your letter gets to your legislator along with a copy of the eyewitness book. And if you are not based in Minnesota, um, feel free to take this template and use it to write a letter to your own legislator wherever you reside, um, because it really is the power of our collective voices that is going to make change in the world. Um, so I'm going to keep this link up here and hope that everyone can copy that and follow through because um, really connecting people with people and sharing our collective stories has been one of my favorite parts of my work. Um, for me, I grew up on the East Coast in Boston, but I found that sharing stories has helped me to build a community here in Minnesota. Um, and when I was growing up, I, I was a really anxious kid. Um, I used to lie in bed at night and I was thinking about everything I was worried about or had to do the next day. And my mom would encourage me to write things down on a piece of paper next to my bed, um, sort of release them and help me find calm. And now that I'm older, I found that sharing stories and listening and learning from others has been a powerful way to build connection, to find hope and motivation in this movement. So um, I hope that we can all lean into this because we are really all experts of our own experiences and all bring a really important uh, perspective and voice to the climate movement. So I'll, with that, um, I'll keep the link up here and I'll post it again in the chat. 
Um, this is some ways that you can keep in touch with climate generation. And if you are interested in getting a copy of the eyewitness book, um, you can go to climateeyewitness.org. Well, Kira, thank you so much for lifting up the power of story. And I'm gonna read something that came in the chat. Um, somebody wrote, I'm inspired by people like Kira who encouraged me to find ways to keep caring and find ways to make an impact. So thank you so much for that. So the next presenter um, today is Sam Grant. And Sam is the executive director of Minnesota 350. Minnesota 350 is emerged in the midst of the climate crisis to promote planetary health specifically by attending to our unacceptable pattern of exceeding biospheric limits, including climate change, biodiversity loss and nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. They focus on bringing down greenhouse gas emissions through an integral action framework that activates and supports collective agency on policy, transportation, agriculture, community resilience, economy, contextualized in ecology, fossil fuel extraction, honoring treaty rights, and the sovereignty of indigenous bodies, including missing and murdered indigenous relatives. And as we were planning this panel today, it was Sam's suggestion that, you know, we are starting, we started with sort of the individual, the micro level, and now Sam is talking now at, at more of the larger system level. So thanks, Sam, for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mary Jo. Good afternoon, my relatives. It's good to be in circle with you and for us all to pay attention to each other from the space of our hearts and from the, the space of our collaborative will, um, not just wishing for healthy relations on the planet, but actually activating in a relational way to realize that health with each other on the planet. So my little mantra for the day is fellow earthlings united for the well-being of all relations, thinking about the intersectionality of planetary people and planetary health. The themes I wanna reflect on with you are how do we move from eco-apartheid, including climate apartheid, to ecological intercultural democracy and make transformative headway on these goals within the next 10 years. How do we set conditions so that health of people and health of planet are mutually reinforcing, mutually reinforcing rather than our current pattern, which is to have a world system that degrades both the earth and degrades all of our human relations. That's the world we have now. We have allowed that world to continue to run. We have the power if we accept the obligation in relation to each other to compost that messed up pattern and bring alive a pattern that actually nourishes the earth and nourishes all relations. So we have to ask questions sometimes about whether we are evolving or not as pitiful two-legged on, on, the, on the planet. There's a lot of knowledge from indigenous you know, um, peoples all over the planet. And there's about 400 million indigenous peoples or more on the planet right now. They haven't gone away. They're still among the most important teachers of the path that we need to be on in order to be in right relationship. We have a global movement of ecological peasants through La Via Campesina that is organizing with a narrative that we can hospice industrial agriculture and we can take care of the earth our bodies and our communities and the future with a bottom-up agroecological revolution um, that really is ecologically sound and socially just um, and also economically viable. We have to pay attention to the reality that we are still trapped in going back to 1415 when Portugal first invaded Africa in 1441 when the first slaves were sold in 1492 when colonization of the Western Hemisphere began. We have allowed a pattern to run for 600 years that is toxic to the earth and toxic to relationship. It's about time we wake up and say, we don't have to allow this pattern to run our lives and relations any longer, and we shouldn't, and we won't. Therefore, let's come together in a healing way in our relationships. And that means we have to be what a good friend of mine um, calls possibilities. So how do we bring possibilities alive through our embodied relationships on the planet and nourish our collective radical imagination? 
We have to transcend what I call shallow sustainability, which is based on the myth that we can solve our ecological crisis with technology and market-based solutions. Focusing exclusively on technology and market-based solutions reinforces eco-apartheid, which I'll you know, get into explaining a couple of slides later. As we think about sustainability, we have to ask this question of sustainability for what and sustainability for who? Certainly not for George Floyd, who got a very stark reminder and served as a stark reminder for the whole planet that we haven't organized a world ecology where all lives matter. And until we have a world ecology where all lives matter, we all have to stand up and say, I'm not gonna be a part of a world system that disrespects any, any people anywhere. And we're still in that world system. So the George Floyd uprising, many of us are hoping was a final moment to mark the beginning of a watershed of co-evolution that honors all lives. Um, so that's a really important thing for us to pay attention to as we think about sustainability. Another important thing to think about is the great work of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that concluded in 2005 and talked about the negative relationship between human well-being and um, ecosystems. And unfortunately, you know, this sort of got caught up in an economic argument about ecosystems and focused on ecosystem services, and which doesn't quite sit well in a relational you know, framework of understanding that there's something more important than economic value. Uh, there's values underneath that, spiritual values, relational values, well-being values. You know, how, how does what we do with each other foster health? But I'm painting you this picture to get to the next slide, which is to look at the significant work done to define key ecosystem services that are in degraded status. Um, working on consensus science, they landed on 15 of 24 core ecosystem services were in significantly degraded status. But as I look at the ecosystem services in relationship to uh, indigenous lives, peasant lives, and, and black lives across the planet, I actually have determined that all 24 core ecosystem services are in degraded status where we live. And so because we are most impacted by problems we did not cause, it is incumbent on all of us in BIPOC bodies all over the planet to organize healing pathways for all of humanity to get in right relationship with each other and with the earth. And I think about this from the perspective of one of my best friends who's a recent ancestor who died on the anniversary of Martin Luther, Martin Luther King's um, assassination back in 2016, Kirk Washington Jr. One of the things he said in one of the living room conversations he famously facilitated in North Minneapolis for many years with his wife, Austin Nebro, was we already know how to be divided. What I want to know is how can we really come together? We've created a world system based on apartheid. When South Africa created its apartheid system, it came to the United States to study the way that the United States um, hostily treated geographically and politically and ecologically native nations here on Turtle Island. We are part of an amazing earth and universe, and yet we've wandered away from healthy relations for 5,000 years through eco-apartheid. It's time to come back home um, to honor all of our relations with each other. I like the way Vandana Shiva talks about this as eco-apartheid. It's based on our division from nature, our divisions from each other, like his race, class, gender, and geographic boundaries, religious you know, conflicts, so on and so forth. And then when you live in a world divided ecologically and divided culturally, you inherently internalize living in a world of division and you become divided inside your own spirit, inside your own way of being. So healing all of that division is the work of this next decade and the network of the work of the 21st century. I like the way Martin Luther King talked about it, that we must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. How do we begin to be more co-creative for healthy co-evolution and live in a world of mutuality? There's a lot of exciting ideas about ways to foster movement towards a circular economy. And as we think about moving towards a circular economy, which is an economy of zero waste, uh, an economy based on regeneration, where we keep products and materials in perpetual use, 
um, as we shift that system, we have to think about and embody a way of doing it that is uh, intercultural, which means it's not a one way street where some group of people that is composed of most of the elites on the planet is able to govern and dictate for all of humanity the direction we take. We have to take a pluriversal approach based on democratic negotiation amongst all cultures. And to get there, we have to go through layers of transformation. Self-transformation is necessary for each of us, uh, transformation through all of our relationships, working on systems transformation, and then finally working on worldview transformation. For me, in my role at MN350, it's really important for me to be really grounded and to consistently talk about how racial justice is climate justice. So we have to bring down greenhouse gas emissions, but do that on a just transitions pathway. We have to heal our social divides that make us enemies of earth and energies and our enemies of each other and learn to be good relatives in right relationship. We have to build and connect evolutionary prototypes of an alternative world ecology that takes care of the earth, takes care of us and takes care of the future. And we gotta do that by a strong intersectionality of race and climate. Uh, this great French philosopher um, who is still amongst us, Edgar Moran, talks about this notion of chrysiology and the planetary crisis. And that in order for us to uh, transcend the planetary crisis, we have to bring alive a form of transformative organizing that does what I've been talking about all along, which is healing all of our relations with each other and with the earth. There's a 600 year of colonialism, racism, you know, heteropatriarchy, Added to that is the COVID crisis. Added to that is the George Floyd uprising. Added to that is the urgency of the 2020 elections. And added to that is the contextualization of the climate crisis in which all of these things are mutually reinforcing each other in ways that further disorder because of the chaos and anxiety some of you have said you're feeling in the chat. We get further disordered, get further caught up in being an individual in this matrix and we lose our capacity and our grace to be good relatives to each other and to actually dream in relation well enough at big enough scale to foster conditions of massive transformation, which are possible today and every day if we choose it. We've got 10 years for three major goals. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50%, transcend the liberal virus that tries to get us to believe individual action can ever be enough. And then we have to engage reform as a transformative disruption of current norms. And then we have to engage revolution as a process of transformative co-creation. Not something to be afraid of, but something that invites us to go deeper into healthy relation with each other. So how are we doing this work at MN350? Um, I've laid out six things that we're doing. Oops, and uh, I got to get back to that slide. Apologize for that. And it's my last slide, so I'm just about done here. We have to do continue our work on pipeline resistance. Okay, I don't know why this is acting up. continue our work on pipeline resistance, continue our work on climate majority, continue our work on clean cars and transit, work on agroecological organizing at all scales, channeling investments towards just transition pathways, and then work on treaty rights and BIPOC organizing. So these are some of the exciting things that we're doing at MN350. And we are inviting all of you to come and join us uh, in this movement. If we want planetary health, we have to sort of imagine and embody ourselves as planetary people. And we have to get out of our own way and stop being a resource for the divisions to continue to run in our lives. And that journey is a daily journey. So I'd like to have you all to think about it as a daily meditation, a daily commitment you make. Um, by doing that with each other, uh, the world we're wishing for comes alive through our relationships today. Many blessings as we do this necessary work. Well, Sam, thank you so much. I think the, the message that you conveyed that each crisis is a transformative opportunity is a real um, powerful message of, of hope. I would next like to introduce a Winona LaDuke. Um, we're very honored to have Winona with us today. Winona is the executive director at Honor the Earth. 
Honor the Earth's mission is to create awareness and support for native environmental issues and to develop needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable native communities. Honor the Earth develops these resources by using music, the arts, the media, and indigenous wisdom to ask people to recognize our joint dependency on the earth and to be a voice for those not heard. So I'll turn it over to Winona. Thank you so much for being here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, just honored to be here with my colleagues and fellow water protectors and you know, those of us that are looking for this good future. You know, a couple things to say, Anishinaabe people have a prophecy which refers to the time of the seventh fire. And in that time, we're told that we have a choice between two paths. One is well-worn but scorched and the other is green. And that is clearly the time we're in now, you know, the time when we must uh, move towards a green path. So I wanna talk a little bit about this, but I, I wanna also talk about this moment in time. And I really like what Erin Dottie Roy discusses, the Indian writer. She refers to a pandemic as portal and points out that in the history of the world, pandemics have changed world societies. And certainly things have changed for us. You know, We would not be changing the way we are if it had not been for a pandemic. And in that she talks, she asks a question. She says, pandemics are portals. A pandemic is a portal. And she says, do you want to bring your dirty skies, your dirty rivers, your, your prejudice, your avarice, your data banks and your hatred through that portal? Or do you want to walk through clean to this new world? And to me, that is really this moment that we have. And I wanna talk a little bit about that moment. Oh my, I seem to have lost my PowerPoint here. <laughs> um, and so um, just a little bit about us from the North. So I am, as many of you know, from Northern Minnesota, the White Earth Reservation is where I'm talking to you from now. And this is a picture of a water protector. This woman, uh, this, this mural went up in downtown Duluth uh, a couple of years ago, 2016, 2017, uh, right during Standing Rock is when she went up. And, you know, Native women are often missing and murdered in the North or invisible. We know that feeling, but this one is loud and proud and she's about uh, 30 feet tall and 20 feet high. I don't know, she's enormous, 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue. This is where I'm from, Gawawiegamug, Round Lake on the White Earth Reservation. This is where I'm talking to you now from. This time is really, um, you know, this is a, some art from our area, Roy Thomas, and this, this piece is called uh, We Are All in One Boat. And I really think that that is this moment. And all the other speakers have talked about the need for collective action, individual responsibility, and, you know, there is no time like the present. I mean, in, in every place that we turn, there are, of course, um, you know, there are, are catastrophes of biblical proportions. There is a political crisis that is of a level that we have not known in our society, you know, or in American society, we'll put it that way. There is, um, you know, disasters of, the, of a pandemic. There's an economic crisis for which there is not an end. And, and you know, I don't wanna say we told y'all so, but, you know, native people have long said, you don't want to mess with mother nature. Don't pick a fight with mother nature because you're not going to win. And so now would be a really good time to kind of reconcile our relations with each other, you know, and make things better. So this is the world that I live in. This is uh, the world of Northern Minnesota. And the place where I live is where the wild things are. That's what I would say. The White Earth Reservation has 47 lakes and 500 bodies of water. The North country is full of immense biodiversity. This is where life is. And on a worldwide scale, the fact is, is that indigenous people, we represent about 4% of the world's population, but we also represent about 80% of the world's biodiversity. So where we are in Northern Minnesota, those seven Ojibwe reservations in Northern Minnesota, you wanna protect those. You wanna protect that land and that water because that is life, that is life. I have wolves and bears and frogs and all kinds of bugs and all kinds of birds. And, you know, I have all kinds of beings up here. And this is where they live and we wanna take care of them. And in our Anishinaabe tradition, other indigenous peoples as well, we have a covenant and agreement that says basically we're a part of this, we don't own it. You know, and I just wanna bring that to you. The times that, you know, we are in, we know, you know, and this is, this is you know, the, the, the fires to the West. But what I wanna say is that in Minnesota, 
you know, I live here in the north and the deepest threat right now to us is this line three pipeline. And just to be clear, you know, it will cause more turmoil than ever, bringing the equivalent of 50 new coal fire power plants online. 50 new coal fire power plants online is what Enbridge Line 3 wants to bring you. This is where it comes from. You know, and I'm talking about this because basically this is, you know, if uh, uh, this is what the gas chambers look like. This is what the gas chambers in the environment look like. And I want to say that, you know, Enbridge's Line 3 is basically an Auschwitz. It's an Auschwitz. And Governor Walz and others are talking about jobs in the North. Well, I'll tell you what, you want to work in a gas chamber and burn people? Just go ahead. That's not what we want to do in Minnesota. And we need to really like own up to being the state and the people that are proud of not of resisting this kind of a strategy. You know, in the world of big oil, these, these projects are failing. The single largest tar sands pipeline failed. I mean, a project, the tar, tar sands project failed in, in February. That was called the tech mine. Project after project is failing. So why would Minnesota wed itself to this ecological and social and human rights disaster? This is what it looks like, you know, as far as the pipes. And it is a disaster for our territories. And I just want to point out, you know, you see at that upper line, how do you end up being an Indian reservation with pipes and railroads and super fun sites? You know, that's what colonialism looks like. And in this moment in time, we have a chance to begin to do things right, which is beginning to deconstruct that infrastructure of so much hatred in our territories. These are my people. You know, this is what it looks like in the North. And I bring this up to you now because the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is faced with the opportunity to not approve the permits for Enbridge's Line 3. The governor is faced with the opportunity to not approve, you know, and to not support Enbridge Line 3. And that needs to be taken because all of us are women that are going to stand on the front lines and we face the, the, the reality that we could be killed. We could be killed. This is what it looked like at Standing Rock and many of us were there. And I will tell you that the equipment that you see, the equipment you see in this, in this photo is available in the town of Park Rapids now. That would be a MRAP. There is no reason that Becker County or let's just be clear, Hubbard County should have an MRAP. There's no reason that military equipment should be ready to deploy, but they are ready to deploy against water protectors in the North. And this is what it looks like when they deploy. I'm telling you, my sisters and friends from the South, we are not kidding. And what we need is a solution. I think it's called the Green New Deal in terms of legislation. You know, I would call it maybe the just transition. But here in Minnesota, we have a chance to not wed ourselves to any more mines, to not wed ourselves to any more dead projects, dead projects or gas chambers. We have an opportunity to make a new just transition. And I'll tell you what, we're ready to go on White Earth. So this is our work. Our work is in restoration of, of uh, our dignity. So our work is in solar. You know, we've been putting up solar thermal panels in Northern communities, and we encourage you to buy them down South too, because the fact is, is that it's cold in the winter, but it's still sunny. And one thing we know is that we could talk all we want, but four months from now, it's gonna be minus 20 up here, and I'd like to have some heat. So my community has been putting up these solar thermal panels South side of houses, can save about 20% of your heating bills. We build them on the reservation. So I'm telling you that the just transition is underway. We got private money, no state money. You know, people look, you know, they need to look at what indigenous people are building already and support our economy and grow it out across the North Country. Need to put more solar up. This is solar at our school, our Pine Point Elementary School. Put this project up a couple of years ago. The just transition is here. The work is here and it needs to be supported. You know, I know a lot of the churches and other institutions are buying solar. Well, let's just keep going. Make things beautiful. These are some pictures from my housing project. You know, 50-year-old housing stock. <laughs> you know, 50-year-old housing stock. But what if we painted it beautiful? So we've been painting. We got 10 murals up. And then we are building the hemp economy. You know, I am, am I'm someone who wants to see the new green revolution. The University of Minnesota brought us the last green revolution with Norman Borlaug, and that was not a good idea for much of the world. And today we have an opportunity to make a new green revolution, and that's with hemp. Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills, and we want them back. And with that, we could grow a new economy that is post-fossil fuels, because anything you make out of oil, you could also make out of hemp. 
This is our hemp crop from a couple of years ago. And next week I'll have a new picture for our hemp crop harvest from our, our reservation. This is with a solution, you know. I mean, in the day and age we have, everything is fast, including our clothing. You know, stores like H&M have opened up and all of those discount places, you know, they have so much clothing and all that stuff is made of fossil fuels. Time to move on. You know, time to move on to something that actually will biodegrade, not last for a thousand years. And then to build our economy. I mean, if cement is the third largest um, source of, of uh, it's I think the third largest man-made material. And I think that it is one of the largest sources of fossil fuel consumption in the world. What if we went to hempcrete? You know, that is the future. We could grow that here in Northern Minnesota. Here's us in our farm last week. You know, we are growing and we are harvesting these foods. And during COVID, you know, a lot of you were despairing in the cities. Well, up north, we all quarantined together and I quarantined with a bunch of teenagers. So that's my life. This is what my life looks like now. And we're farming and growing food for our community because we know that change is made by the hands of individuals. We could talk all kinds of stuff, but in the end, we got to eat. So we planted and planted and hoed and hoed. And here we are. And then, uh, you know, for the future, we all need to work together, buy local food, reduce our consumption of pretty much everything, quit being so wasteful, quit acting like pigs, hogs, <laughs> whatever, and then make the next economy. I like showing this picture because this is the Port of Duluth and this is wind turbine parts coming in. We don't make anything in Minnesota. We used to make cool stuff, but you know what we do now? We ship it in. So 90% uh, of the wind turbine parts are coming from Europe or China into the Port of Duluth and shipping over to Nebraska. How about we start making some stuff here? Let's make a real Green New Deal in Minnesota. Let's have peace. That's it. I want to thank you for your time and uh, happy to answer questions later on. Miigwech. Well, thank you so much, Winona. We're going to open up now for all the panelists to um, bring your videos up. And um, a number of questions have been raised. And I'm going to start with you, Winona. Um, somebody asks, what's the best way for us to engage to combat the Enbridge line? So those of us that are not up north and are maybe in the metro area, some, do you have some concrete suggestions of what people might do? Well, you can continue to push it in this election year because the sad thing is, is that Democrats actually have no vision either. You know, I mean, I'm not, a, I don't got a dog in this fight. I'm not a Democrat or Republican. I'm a green, you know, but I was like, come on, y'all have a vision for the next economy. So make this a real issue, really push on it, you know, at the state, push walls, push the, you know, and then push the solution, you know, but I will say, keep posted and look at our website and stop line3.org, you know, because I think it's about time for people to come visit the North Country before I have to kiss it goodbye, because Enbridge is rolling out right now, and we expect in the next month that they will try to begin, you know, putting more stuff in our territory. So if you haven't been to your cabin, you should come see it again. It's beautiful in the North Country, and come stand with us. There's going to be a need. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. But the North is nice, you know. That's why we live in Minnesota. Yeah. So Sam, I want to um, pose the next question to you. And Sam, you've disappeared from our screen. Can you pull your video back up? Oh. I wonder if Sam's still there or maybe we lost Sam. So you know what, I'll go to um, Julia oh, yeah. and um, and asked this question um, about, uh, the question came in from the representatives from Interfaith Power and Light. Um, so it's for you and Catherine. How can we help faith leaders understand that the environment should really be a spiritual priority? Are there some things that you found particularly successful? You know, that's a, it's a wonderful question and there's many layers. Um, you know, I guess if you look at any major faith tradition and ask what are, you know, what are spiritual priorities, right? Um, people talk about uh, loving one's neighbor. Um, people talk about justice, fighting for justice. Um, if you look at, um, you know, Allah says, you know, even if there's plenty of water, you don't want to waste a drop of it because uh, um, it sort of shows disregard for the water. And, um, 
And so, you know, those are just little tiny gems of, of a, you know, sort of the beginning of a thought process around what our own relationship is with each other and with the natural world. Um, you know, I think that, that getting to know our neighbors and caring about, um, you know, that's, that's sort of a first step. I think if we over overemphasize um, just the natural world all the time and forget about the fact that the natural world is the basis upon which we build our communities. Um, it can become sort of shrill. Um, but at the end of the day, it's when you stand on the ground or when um, you are uh, harvesting your own food that we realize that we're all just part of this bigger um, story that uh, is not human controlled. We might have a glimpse at the, um, at the you know, uh, that new world through the portal that Winona was talking about. You know, what is that new world going to look like? I can um, add a, a personal experience. Um, you know, I went to one of, we have a social justice minister at our congregation. I went and said I wanted to work on uh, climate change issues. She, uh, she embraced that and we started a group and then that led her to to do one of her sermons, um, one of the you know major sermons uh, in the around Earth Day around that, and then we, then that led us to putting on a, a webinar for actually it was going to be an all day workshop, but then because of COVID, we made it virtual. But I think you know the questioner is asking how to help support uh, faith leaders and. What I, what I found in my experience is that the congreg if congregants come to the faith leaders and say, this is important to us, we want you to bring it onto the Sunday morning pulpit, as well as help us support that kind of activity in the congregation, that they're going to be receptive to that. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one more quick thing? I actually have a lot of energy right now. Winona and I are working on getting faith leaders to have an opinion about uh, what's happening up north along line three. Um, and so when I talk to them, the, the thing that is most uh, frustrating to me is that there's a lot of faith leaders who think it's their job to be friendly and uh, supportive to every single person in the world. And actually like real love isn't always real friendly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'd like some of these faith leaders to be brave um, to really take up the work of um, thinking about what real justice looks like and not be afraid to, to say what needs to be said. Mm -hmm. So courage, honesty, transparency. So yeah. Sam, this next question I'm gonna to pose to you. Um, somebody writes, thank you so much for sharing about the intersectionality of racial, racial justice and climate justice. What are some things that white allies can do right now to use their privilege and advocate for climate and racial justice? Well, I wanna first respond to this line three thing, because I think they're related. As people take responsibility for the intersectionality of your identity and climate integrity, I think that you have to go on an inevitable journey of canceling any form of privilege you have held that makes you reluctant to give all you've got to the well-being of the planet and the well-being of all people. So I think it's important for people who walk around in white skin privilege to ask yourself, what does it mean in the 21st century to be white? There's one thing to be a person of light skin. You know, some people call it skin that's more pale. Whatever you want to call your lighter skin, how do you decouple what your skin looks like from your history and your relationship to colonialism and all systems of oppression. So I want white people to connect with me as earthlings. Winona had a slide up that said, we're all in the same boat. And so my question for white folks is how do you begin to live in the same boat as we do? There was a native elder up in Canada uh, where I was doing a workshop with the Fourth World Congress. And he said, the hurt of one is the hurt of all and the honor of one is the honor of all but we live in a world system based on division where it doesn't turn out to be true. That when people in the global South, indigenous people, peasants, BIPOC people are feeling pain, white people can turn off the, turn the channel. 
So there's all these ways that you are privileged to not be in relationship and to not feel the reality that the more complex reality that sort of shapes the whole world we share. My invitation to you, my encouragement to you, my loving um, perspective offered to you is step one is on a personal level end your segregation from us. In all ways you can end your segregation. It happens very often when I talk to a person in a, in a white male cis body. Um, so Sam, I want to do the right thing, but I don't know where to start. And I was like, well, where do you live? And you know, I said, tell me where they live. Uh, where do you work? And they tell me where they work. Where do you worship? And they tell me where they worship. Where do you play? And they tell me where they play. And 100% of all of those things are places that, that where reality is segregated. They're only living and working with people who look like them and have a perspective similar to them. Well, that reality is going to keep us apart. So my advice is to cancel your relationship to segregation. Get into deep relationship with people who are different than you. I'm an organizer. Whenever a new population moves to the Twin Cities region, I reach out and I say, I want to know your story. And as I get to know your story and learn how to be a good relative to you, at some point you might decide to be reciprocal and be a good relative to me. But I have to be the first one to reach out and be a good relative to you. So I think that relational reciprocal work is the key for all of us, regardless of what skin bag you're walking around the planet in. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, Kira, I'm gonna pose this next question to you. Um, somebody writes, do you feel that people are becoming more accepting of the realities of climate change and more willing to take action than in previous years? Or are people increasingly recoiling and feeling helpless? And how do you help people find hope and subsequently take action? Yeah, um, I think you can have a bit of both. I think we've definitely seen that there are more conversations in the media and in the mainstream about climate change now. but um, it can be hard, especially when we're dealing with multiple crises at one time to not feel that same hope, that despair, overwhelm feeling. And um, I think we don't always have to separate those two. We can lean into the emotions that we're feeling around climate change um, and, and use those as motivation and when we talk about it too. Um, so I think there's definitely been more conversation. I think that we can also push ourselves to push the conversation a little bit so that in, um, you know, when we're talking about climate change on um, in policy or on the highest stage, we're not just asking about if people understand climate change is happening, but if they understand the intersections that climate change has with racial justice, with economic justice, um, and digging deeper into those conversations, because I think that is a really important part of it as well. There may have been a second part of that question, but. Well, that was good. This next question I'm gonna open up for all of you. And um, so anybody can kind of take a stab and we can sort of move around the circle. Somebody writes, we always um, say, get involved, get organized. When the average person is in debt to their eyeballs and whooped at the end of the day, how does one disconnect from all the powerful system? Well, Sam, do you want to start with that one? The mayor of peace is always going to ask these challenging questions. So thanks, Melvin, for <laughs> asking such simple questions. Um, and I think the, uh, the parable that the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step is what I want to say to people who feel completely blocked from well-being. The second thing I want to say is that we're all relatives and none of us are going to be our best selves when we are isolated and fragmented and nobody has our back. So I think the key is for each of us to the extent we're able to put on our own oxygen mask and say, I'm gonna pay attention to the complexity of relationships and I'm gonna engage in fostering the well-being of self, of relation, of planet and of all people. And I'm gonna invite everybody in my small universe to join me there. And in my experience so far, and Melvin, you and I have done some of this work together, when we catch somebody who is blocked and unable to breathe, and we put a loving hand on a person's spine, and we say, I am here with you as your relative, and I'm gonna stand next to you and we're gonna breathe together, and you're gonna know you're not alone because you're gonna feel it in this moment. 
And after a few moments of breathing together, I'm going to invite you to cry if you need to cry, shake if you need to shake, <laughs> scream if you need to scream, dance if you need to dance. But I'm going to stay right here with you as you define the next possible step for you to step into your dreaming process. So you bring alive what you're hoping for on the planet. And in my experience, when you give people that loving regard, that kind of tangible loving support, people evolve. And so I believe given my 30 plus years of experience as an organizer, everybody can move because I've seen it happen. People at that crispy edge of giving up on life have come back to full flowering. So I just want to give that encouragement to all of us. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to disconnect from the powerful system in relationship. Yeah. yeah. So anybody else want to take a stab at that, Julia? Yeah. Um, you know, um, thank you, Sam. You've, you've spurred my, um, you've just spurred my imagination. I think that um, one of our biggest challenges is that people jump in and the way that the work is constructed in this very white uh, sort of space that we live in in this world often um, is that you've got to do something and you've got to succeed and there's all this shame around, you know, did you attend the meeting on time and um, it can be just exhausting being an organizer in this world or taking action in this world. And I think if we were to pull away some of the expectation around engagement, uh, we might be able to lean into what Sam has invited us to do, which is to be in relationship. And uh, we might succeed in incredible, you know, transformative ways that we weren't expecting. Um, but I think that, you know, and there's, I'm, it's wonderful to be on, on this panel together. And I think there's a lot of support among Minnesota nonprofits, but there's also all kinds of jostling around about what action is the best action to take. Um, and the first step is to do something that gives you energy, um, to do it with other people um, and to see those people um, for what they give. And then if you have to step back for a quick moment because something happens in your life, which happens all the time for many of the people we work with, then that's also honored. Um, so if we gave each other a little bit of space to be our whole selves, maybe it wouldn't feel de-energizing. I always like to ask myself, um, did that thing, that meeting, that action I took, that grant that I wrote, did it deplete my energy or did it give me back energy? Mm -hmm. And sometimes going out to take action with other people actually fills our cups instead of depletes them. Really good point. Really good point. Um, Kira, I'm going to ask you this next question. You know, Will Steger did so much um, to bring environmental education to schools. I think he's so well known for that work. And this person as right, that's um, writing asks you, um, do you see an increase in schools that are now teaching about climate change? So, so what are you seeing out there? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think not only just in the number of schools or classrooms that are incorporating climate change into their curriculum, but also the diversity of different ways that people are doing that. So traditionally we think about including climate change in just the science classroom only, but we've seen a really big push to incorporate that into social studies curricula, into um, humanities and language arts, thinking about all these connections in different ways that students can learn about how to engage in climate um, really early on, not just from a a policy, uh, a science or a research lens, but from a policy lens or from a, a writing lens, thinking about these different ways. So we are excited by a lot of momentum from teachers to see that it's really growing and the demand um, for incorporating it, not just into science classrooms, but really across the, the board with education. Um, so Catherine, this question um, it came from actually the chat. Somebody said, if I want my faith community to get engaged and having conversations about this topic, um, where do I start? And can we turn to, you know, your organization? Maybe Julia can answer this better, but Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light is very open and welcome to have any congregation or any group connect. Uh, Julia, you want to share how they would do that? You know, we have, all of us have little lanes in this um, movement. Uh, if there, we, we like to engage faith communities because we feel like people are able to um, gather their friends through their faith community. It's like an, it's like an instant list 
Um, and so the way that people do that through MNIPL is we encourage people to find one or two or three people from that faith community that's willing to sort of take the lead on being the sort of the rapid responder within that congregation. So that when Winona says, hey, it's time for you all to come and visit us up in the north, I can call up that list of community connectors and say, who's in? And um, so that's um, you know, sort of the way it works. Uh, we also have lots of folks who have joined us um, sort of individually, but I know that that's true for many of these organizations. Um, so, so I don't want MNIPL.org, that's your link. Mm -hmm. Sam, I'm gonna pitch this question to you. Um, how do we move people who fear losing their comforts and convenience when getting active or changing their perspective? Mm. People, there's a saying, you have to let go to let come. Uh, so my advice, since you know we're you know in the Earl Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, is to realize that our lives are made beautiful and rich, not by overly hoarding what we have, mm -hmm. but by bringing what we have to a circle with the light and saying, I want to share this with you. Mm -hmm. What do you want to share with me? And what people share with you might be really different. And at first, you might feel a nudge to be protective of what you've acquired. My advice is to continue to go back to the circle mm -hmm. and keep going back to the circle, laughing at yourself all the way. Oh, how pitiful am I? I love all the things I have. I don't want to let any of it go, but I will keep coming back to the circle. What I've learned is that as long as you keep coming back to the circle, eventually, something is gonna compel your heart to let go in order to let come. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to the point I made earlier about segregation. As long as you don't know how your reality is related to the reality of people who have a different walk than you, you're not gonna change. So I think white folks have to get out of your comfort zone, which means stop only relating to people who reinforce your worldview. So Ulysses asked this question, I'm gonna go ahead and jump on it right here, right now, since I just sort of opened up the space for it, Mary Jo. Part of what it means to share the planet is to realize that all of us have a complementary perspective. None of us have the whole truth. None of us can ever have the whole truth. Truth is born through dialogue, born through relationship. So bring what matters to you to the circle and let it be a complement to what other people bring to the circle. So this is one of the gifts coming out of African philosophy right now, this notion of complementarity, which is you know, very much in, uh, in a tune with what indigenous philosophies are saying all over the planet. So is your materiality more important than your spirituality? Mm -hmm. Is your possessions more important than your relations? If you recognize that your relations and your spirituality and your evolution as a relative on the planet is the most important thing, it's the sacred thing that defines who and what you are, then honor what Teilhard de Chardin said, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. If you can resonate with that, it's easier for you to let go. If you have a hard time noticing and seeing yourself as a spiritual being, then I have to say, you have had your consciousness in your heart kind of hijacked by a system that is giving you lots of privileges and benefits. So if that's true for you, ask yourself this question. How might all of the privileges and benefits I'm continuing to hold, consciously and unconsciously, having a negative impact on the well-being of the earth and other people? How can I begin to take responsibility for that? So no matter where you are, there's a beginning place. If I could just add to that wonderful, what you did, Sam, was fabulous. Um, so I, as a person, a, a white person of privilege, I, you know, I've been trying to think about how am I going to stop traveling so much by airplanes? Um, that was a, you know, that was one of the things I was holding on to as I love to travel. COVID is my teacher. So I have not been on an airplane since February and probably won't be on an airplane for a, a very long time. So I have had this experience of, of changing my behavior, not because I willed it to happen, but it happened to me. But I've learned so many things about that. I'm, 
I'm all of a sudden I'm having a much better relations with my neighbors because we're not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm on the block. We have every Tuesday, Thursday, we have uh, stretching exercises on the sidewalk. Uh, we have a concert series every Saturday night where we bring in musicians and everybody's passing the hat. And so we're building the tribe is being built in the neighborhood, which I mean, I knew my neighbors sort of before, but now I really know my neighbors. So there's, so COVID as horrible as it is, is also a, is a teacher. It's a portal, as you said. So we're learning, you know, I'm, I'm reducing my carbon footprint because I'm not on an airplane. Uh, that's all good. And I'm building relationships in a much deeper way. Well, this has been just an incredible panel today. I mean, each of your presentations was so deep and insightful and have really appreciated, you know, your, the, your responsiveness to the questions and so many powerful messages. I mean, the, the gift, as you were saying, Catherine, that comes from COVID, um, Sam, your messages of let go and then let come. And I think all of you really carried the message today that consciousness precedes action. Um, and so, you know, whatever we can do to increase our awareness and increase our con consciousness and then reach out and make connections is going to be, you know, part of the part of the transformation. I want to um, move to some uh, closing um, comments. First of all, I want to thank you all for attending today's event. As you consider the ideas that were presented by today's guests, I encourage you to visit their websites um, because they've all given a call to action today. And I also invite you to go to the center's website, um, taking charge of your health and well-being. There's a new section there on planetary health, and I think you um, will enjoy exploring some of that new content. If you missed part one or two of this series, <clears throat> videos from the events are available on our website at csh.umn.edu. Events like today would not be possible without the efforts of the center's team. So I really wanna thank Molly and Sue, Kit, Diane, the entire center team for all your hard work and dedication. And if you enjoyed this event, we'd be grateful for your generous support. The center is grateful for your gifts of any size Make your donation at csh.umn.edu or simply click the give button in the evaluation that you'll receive for this event. Once more, I'd like to thank uh, Julia, Catherine, Kira, Sam, and Winona for their participation today. And thank you all of, all of you for joining us for the series. Visit our website soon to find out about our 2021 Wellbeing Series. Our lineup will include Nicole Cardoza, founder of the Anti-Racism Daily Newsletter, and in his award-winning serial social entrepreneur, investor, author, and public speaker, making wellness accessible for everyone. We'll be announcing our other speakers um, soon. So thanks um, again um, for all of you for participating today. Thanks for your active um, engagement in the chat today. Have a great evening and take good care.